now we'll move on and today we're starting a new series of conversations with great Australian writers where we'll discuss their work, influences, inspiration and the books they love to read. First up is the Sydney author Thomas Keneally who is perhaps best known for the book Schindler's Ark which won the Man Booker Prize and of course was made into it an Oscar winning film. Now writing about Australian histories, American presidents and more recently a history of famine he's been recognised as an Australian living treasure and Thomas Keneally joins us now from Sydney. Thomas Keneally, it's a privilege to have a living treasure on our program. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, don't believe that stuff. Oh, I do, and uh, tens of thousands would as well, Tom. Now, you've uh, just recently turned 76. You've pumped out more than 30 novels over your career. What inspires you, what motivates you to keep on writing? Uh, well, at literary festivals, writers go on about how tormented their life is and how solitary and it is true that writings like dying or giving childbirth you can't rent anyone to do it for you but uh, it, it's also a transcendent experience as well it uh, and and I do it for the uh, the buzz uh, you get from the sense of writing well and that sense of uh, characters coming to you and events coming to to you while you write uh, that you hadn't thought of two hours before and which add to the structure of uh, the the novel and then in history the fact you never heard before for example in the 1950s uh, the atomic tests emu field uh, a family of Aboriginals uh, camped uh, just near the um, crater of one of the explosions and uh, they were on their way to Annabella to visit relatives they hadn't seen for years. They didn't know it was anything sinister. Uh, this is eloquent of things you never really knew and uh, that's the thrill. And it's great to get such a thrill from it still. Let's, let's go back 50 or so odd years, Tom, and you began life as a student priest. I think you've said in the past it's about the only thing you have in common with Tony Abbott. How, how did you get into writing after leaving that training? Well, uh, I was actually uh, a fairly lost soul when I left. Um, uh, I did have uh, conflicts that were mainly mental and unexpressed with my superiors in the seminary uh, and uh, uh, when I left I um, was trying to find a place for myself in society and uh, in 1962, 63, a long time ago, over that summer I decided to write a novel. It was easy to get novels published then, uh, honestly, because the novel was king now non-fiction and cookery books are king. But in those days, uh, uh, publishers were far more forgiving of imperfect novels. When I got it published, there was no society of authors, there were no literary festivals, there was no one to tell me uh, that uh, I couldn't make a living out of publishing. And so I just went ahead and, and did it. In fact... And, uh, uh, tried to write a book a year. And uh, you have said as well in the past that that first novel, uh, Place at Whitton, essentially saved your life. Well, I think so. I think I would have been a bit of a lost soul, uh, possibly uh, alcoholic, uh, quite possibly a psychiatric uh, patient and quite possibly um, uh, homeless. Uh, but I think... Uh, uh, because I was very tormented at the time. Uh, but uh, through my uh, first novel, I was able to meet girls and I <laughs> met my wife. And I, I suddenly had a life I didn't have when I left the seminary. And looking back at this, uh, this epic career churning out so many award-winning novels, do you have a piece of work, fiction or non-fiction, that stands out as your favourite? Uh, well, surprisingly, or not surprisingly, the one, the favourite child you have is the one you're carrying at the moment. And I have a novel coming out later this year uh, named Daughter of Mars, Daughters of Mars, rather, and it's about World War I nurses, 
and I, I love the two girls in it. I love the two sisters. And so it's sort of my favorite. Uh, my, uh, in, in terms of history, uh, my favorite is my uh, new history, uh, which I happen to have in the studio. <laughs> uh, but it, it covers Australia from uh, uh, 1860. It's social history. It's about obscure Australians you may never have heard of up to the peace treaty in 1920 and and at the at the moment i'm writing a third volume from 1940 uh, uh 1920 uh, well probably up well into the menzies era so the work you're doing that's not yet published is generally your favorite work because you're so close to it and you're doing it because you're in love with it whereas older books are like love letters written long ago. If you ever go back to your old love letters, they often seem banal, if not outright stupid and embarrassing. You had to move house in Sydney fairly recently, and as part of that move, you decided rather reluctantly, obviously, to part with your massive library of books, thousands of books. You essentially donated them away. How hard was that for an author, any author is so tied to the book, the concept of the book, to part with such, such a massive, massive treasure trove of books? Well, I told Frank Lowy uh, uh, about this, and he, he put up the money for a beautiful little library at, uh, which is located in Pitt Street in Sydney, in the old Sydney Mechanics School of Arts. And uh, all the books are there, and my family have absolute borrowing rights, and uh, so I haven't lost those books. I've, I've gained a library which is more beautiful than actually the one I had at home. The one I had at home was very messy. I mixed books up. I had... Uh, uh, sort of autographed cricket balls all over the place, a few deflated uh, rugby league balls, uh, boxes of documents on the floor. Uh, now uh, this uh, beautiful little library uh, lives on and will after uh, the curtain is drawn uh, upon me. And uh, I, I it, it wasn't as hard. Sometimes I hold a book in my hand before taking it up there and think, I really want to have this close to me. But then I think um, it, it lives on in a better place. Of course, these thousands of books in these digital age, this digital age can be downloaded onto a tablet-sized device, as you well know. What uh, do you see, Thomas, as the, the future of the paper book? It's, it's very interesting. The paper book should be dead and it's not but it is living cheek by jowl with the e-book and there's no denying the e uh, the, the e-book rules okay and uh, you can't uh, uh, stand with your arms out against technology um, at the moment the old-fashioned gutenberg style book that we started to publish in the late uh, 15th century and still publish is is holding up well you see you see them in people's hands um, uh, older people like me value them more but I, I read books uh, in all formats and I notice that um, my grandson who's 12 and of course a brilliant boy and a no future Nobel Prize winner uh, etc he is um, uh, he, he reads the the um, published book uh, when he's in bed at night and uh, for enjoyment, and he uses his iPad more for games than for e-books. But uh, I've got e-books myself, and uh, the number of e-books there are online is just a treasure to anyone uh, writing history, because. Um, uh, instead of chasing up an old book in an antiquarian catalogue somewhere or trying to find which library it is in in Australia, it's often there uh, online in, uh, on websites like Project Gutenberg mm. or other websites that I can access. And so the, 
the electronic age uh, is is a marvel. I was writing the other day, for example, about um, uh, I'm trying to write a novel now about the Kara outbreak in 1944, when nearly 300 young Japanese immolated themselves quite deliberately um, uh, in a prison uh, breakout out there uh, in a normal Australian town uh, called Kara. Mm. Now, all the government documents are on the National Archives website and you just click digital copy and all the documents are there. What Curtin, what Prime Minister Curtin said about it at the time, what the Swiss Red Cross said about uh, this great immolation at the time, what the Japanese newspapers were saying uh, and what individual citizens of Kara and individual Japanese said. And these are resources that one would have had to go to a mm. lot of trouble to get in times past. Now we're just fast running out of time, Thomas Keneally. One question I do want to ask you, you suggested the uh, cooking book was the, the most popular gen genre at the moment. I'm just wondering, obviously, when the Thomas Keneally cookbook is going to hit the stands. Uh, I'm afraid there's very little market for uh, uh, a book on uh, scrambled eggs <laughs> and stew. I think you'd find tens of thousands of people would read it though, Thomas Keneally. It's been a great privilege and a pleasure to speak to you this morning. Thank you very much for your time. Not at all. It's, it's uh, great to be here. Thank you.